go live and it should be let me make sure actually where's the screen there we go it says it's live let's make sure we got a video feed all right how's the video feed tell me if i have audio audio check all right so this is the uh new combination of building my office into a studio all in one so there's a desk right here that you can't see very well we'll get to pictures of that in a moment uh but there is a little garbage here and there i'm trying to pick things up it's actually funny when the chat's there because now i don't have the full screen of the window but nonetheless i will be doing a new studio tour office tour at least of my area because it did change quite a bit uh we've been just cleaning out and throwing out a lot of stuff kind of took opportunity here at the office to remodel things a bit um which is how this ended up on my desk because we do accept we're not doing retail anymore we still had this there discover mastercard and visa so if you'd like to just throw money at me um we takes all all forms of monies however you want to send the money i'm fine with that but among the things that we can do now is we got two camera feeds here so this camera looks over another monitor and this is actually pretty cool because it allows me to uh, go back and forth between a couple different views what i always did before was i would have a laptop right here and that laptop would be where i pulled the feed now i've got a big 49 inch um wide screen monitor over here then a standard 1920 1080 right here off to the side and a camera looking over it so when i do my tutorials it's way easier to do matter of fact let me um oh, and too many keyboards now if i turn off the live chat you kind of get an idea this is the desk that is right here. So anyways, if you, I had pictures I posted on Twitter of how this looks uh, when it was almost complete. So it's really close to being 100% the way I want it. And that's it. The goal is this is just kind of my creative space. So I want to be able to uh, do videos, which I have some upcoming videos on these. Uh, pop these out real quick. Someone had mentioned, and I did a video talking about cabling and things like that these are your sfp 28 25 gig fiber modules these are 25 gig dac cable and then this is a uh, 25 gig card with sfp 28 connectors on there so i have some upcoming videos i'll be doing that are all about doing everything on 25 gig and breaking it down so uh taking major credit cards during your broadcast why not seems like a you know <laughs> uh why not go from there uh let's see do, 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 do. yeah for everything else there's mastercard but uh yes i want to dive into doing a few videos on this because there's yeah you know, always confusion or what, you know, it just comes down to what people want to hook up and what should you use where. That's why I did that video the other day. Matter of fact, I kind of did that um, more than once where I I did the video, but then realized I had too much in it and narrowed the video down. And even narrowed down, the video was 17 minutes long because there's a lot of things to talk about. And why 25 gig and not QSFP 40? Because 25 gig is cool. And, uh, you can then bond together a few 25s and go your 100 gig, you know, with the switch over there. Uh, we'll talk about all that in an upcoming video. So both are good choices. It all depends on what your goals are and what you're trying to do. If you should use QSFP40 or if you use uh, 25 gig and single, simple SFP DAC cables at 25 gig, pretty easy way to get your server connected at 25 gig. And I'll be talking about that in that video. So, but Corey's got a good point. There are other standards out there such as QSFP40. So... Uh, what's your opinion of the new unified 1025 fiber switch? I have a lot of the one gig and going to be moving to 10 gig. Um, we did some testing with it, real base testing. I have a lot of things here. Uh, just out of camera view, there's a Synology 25 gig. We're assembling some 25 gig servers here. Uh, we're going to do a 25 gig test and we're going to use the unify for all the connectivity and, uh, so I will be doing, I, I have had the switch and we plugged a bunch of stuff all 10 gig into it, but I haven't tested it at 25 gig. And until I tested it at 25 gig, I said, why well, do the review? But I've got it. It's actually just out of reach of the camera right now uh, is the 25 one. So yeah, you go Ubiquity Leaf at 100 gig. Eh, you know, so uh, 
just sent a you a message in your email website. Check it out. Uh, okay, that's fine. We have a forum for people that want to talk to us. Um, or we have forums if you want to engage with us in a forum type thing. Anyways, what else do we have in here? How's the 45 drives been treating me? Great. Uh, that, though, is going to move into the other room. We're building a rack in the other room. This is also among the things that are uh, projects that we're trying to do. First, we shuffled around offices. Then we're going to build a rack in the other room. The problem is I have too many things to end up running. I need them running, and I can't have them running in here because of some extra noise it'll create. As quiet as those servers are, the noise filter helps filter them out, but there's still ambient noise they do create, and it starts getting cumulatively worse as you add more servers. So once the, um, I'll be doing some updated videos on it as we move it to the other side so it can be on all the time and not making any noise. So, yes. Um... Oh, just seen the thumbnail. That's an old server uh, that's actually going to find a new home soon. And the server in the thumbnail is going to be something that uh, I probably will do one more video on. It's an older freelance server, but I want to talk about how JBOD works and how cards work with uh, ZFS and TrueNAS and, well, really when you're using a lot of uh, drives. So I'm going to have one more demo with it. And then it's actually probably going to end up over uh, somewhere else for someone else to make some videos with. So... Um, let's see, is your free PBX still running well? Free PBX still, um, it still runs great. We have no problems with free PBX. Uh, that's still, that's still what we're on the back end. You know, a lot of people ask me about doing more free PBX videos. I think Chris from Crosstalk has a new series, an updated series on free PBX. I'm not the free PBX person, so Chris is probably better to ask. But as far as using it, yes, we use it. Yes, it works here at the office, so... I do a lot of true NAS, that is for sure. Um, is there a penalty for RAID 10 versus using that? Uh, that gets complicated. I would still go ZFS over RAID 10, like your RAID Z series ones. Um, it kind of depends on what you're going to be running out. There's not like these people look for uh, binary answers for storage servers. And as you dive into testing storage servers, you'll start realizing it depends it depends on a lot of things when you're tuning them everything down to the block size to the application you're running on them will cause a dramatic change in the way things end up working um to do to do i want true nas to run on my r510 but it won't detect my eight hard drives that is the part i wanted to talk about when you have these pass-through cards um specifically a server that i'm holding in a thumbnail has a couple lsi cards in there Dell has cards that will work with ZFS and TrueNAS because it has to have direct access. Dell normal RAID cards, which are found in a majority of Dell servers, will probably not work properly, if at all, depending on which one they are. So um, it's just one of those things where it's there's it's hard to get it to work in, the, in every situation there. Oh, let's see. Uh, what RAID card do I have? Um, oh, I see someone's asking that person that. Perfect. Two. Uh, oh, has my business been affected by the rains? Uh, that's a fair question. We've had some flooding. We directly are at an elevation of 562 feet above the Detroit River from where we are right now. So it has not really affected us. Indirectly, yes, because I know a lot of people that have been flooded out of their houses. Uh, the flooding has occurred poor, just and caused lots of problems with freeways and everything else. So there's lots of indirect effect. And of course, any friends that were caught up or had floods uh, happen to them were the indirect. So directly, no, my building sets up high enough. And my house as well, the current house I live in, sets up at an elevation um, that the floodwaters go elsewhere. The uh, down the, like down the street from my house flooded, but where my house is is and and that's not by accident or any coincidence. I literally, when we bought the new house, looked for a place with a higher elevation because floods suck. Uh, my other house was uh, partially that my yard used to flood. Let's see what do we got here. Uh. Linux can see all eight. Yeah, uh, that now that if you're seeing Linux to see the drives, but you can't see them in ZFS, it may be that if you're using BSD, it's a unsupported card. So 
that may be the issue right there. And it may not be supported in BSD at all. And whether or not you'll be able to get it supported in BSD. Ah, uh, maybe not. It's hard to say. To do have another one with smart error. Yeah. Smart errors are fun. Uh, UDP flooding for sure, not TCP flooding. There, there's no acknowledgement going back. We can acknowledge, I guess, though it's flooded, but. <laughs> uh, let's see. What's up with the credit card sign for the, uh, it, we were cleaning up the front area. We don't do walk-ins or retail anymore, but we had this. So, uh, but if anyone would like to just send money to us, we accept Visa, MasterCard, and Discover. <laughs> oh, and PayPal. We actually accept all of these via PayPal. So it's a, uh, that's the thing. What was on my topic list here? So new studio is part of it. And let me see if I can pull this off and not lose audio. That's the trick. It was losing audio. Really, I don't know why. Um, if this works, I should be able to switch the live stream to my phone. I was playing with this uh, setup earlier. It's kind of neat. Mm, go here. Go here. Yeah. Put password in here. I want to play with some of these new fancy things that we can do like this. And we'll say camera back there we go so we got the back camera hit start now if it works right we should be able to do this and go over to phone oh, actually i gotta close something that's on the screen over here and close that there we go hey all right do we have audio someone let me know if we have audio there's kyle he's in the kitchen i me. Yep, Kyle's making salad. Um, so what the studio looks like. We can actually, cool thing is, we can also do this. So they're not glaring at you. This is what it looks like from the other side. There's that 10 gig switch. Seems to be working. Yes, we have audio. Awesome. I see the bars moving, but doesn't necessarily mean it's working. This is how I see myself on the main camera. Main camera. But this is the desk part. You got to kind of pan back and forth to see this giant monitor over here. This is on a stand right here. And uh, then there's that camera. Everything's mounted to different mounts so everything can be moved around. This is attached to my computer. Everything else up here goes around down to the studio computer. But yep, that's that widescreen. Oh, there's the Synology stuff that's uh, going to be the 45 gig or 25 gig videos. So give me some ideas here. But this is what it looks like. So now now you guys have an idea of oh, how this looks. And uh, it looks weird when the lights are off. Turn the lights back on. Raise the lights. I like it having a remote and things like that. Lots of upgrades. So I got to do a new studio tour. <sighs> oh, videos full of artifacts. Yeah. Yeah, it's probably going to, um, it's, I mean, it's streaming from a phone into OBS and then bringing the stream back out over to YouTube probably is going to cause some artifacting and loss. Just gonna, that's kind of an expected thing that might happen on there. So, yeah, it's, um, I'll do a full tour of the setup because a, a little bit more fine tuning, a few more RGBs, you know, make it look cool. And uh, then... You know, also, because like you can see behind me now, I have this camera that I can actually switch to and talk as well. Uh, so a few more changes and I'll do a full tour of the studio and break down all the stuff. Now, as far as like the parts list, it's the same parts list. A few people ask like how the holders and brackets, none of that's really changed. It's the same brackets, just arranged differently. So that'll, um, that'll be fun. Plus we can do this and double up me and go back over here. I just like, I like how the switching on this. It's just so cool. All right. Um, how dare your cell phone not stream 4K? Yeah, I agree. <laughs> All right. Um, one of the other, uh, why SLRs instead of PTZ cameras? Uh, SLRs just look better than PTZ. That's the bottom line. I have not seen a PTZ camera that can do what, this is a, a Canon studio camera, uh, your C100 cinema camera by Canon, uh, C100 Mark II to be specifically, uh, the other camera, which is this one here, this is a Sony A6600. 
I'm not aware of a PTZ camera that will do the quality these will. Maybe there are some, but these are designed, well, the Sony's kind of an SLR. This is a studio camera that we're looking at right now. It's going to get a better, matter of fact, especially when you want like the focus to be like this. If, you know, I want to hold something up for demonstration. The lenses are fast focusing and uh, I, I like the new, the cool, you know, bokeh that you get in the background. So, <laughs> Um, all right. The UDM pro SC, I have no interest in it. I may, so I may put together cause I just, am kind of, I don't know what to do with the stuff other than I buy it and give it away. Um, so I don't know if I'm going to do that with the UDM pro SE. There's nothing about it that really impresses me. Uh, it's got the extra features, but it's still a unified routing equipment that has all the problems that come with a unified routing equipment because of that. I'm not sure if I'm going to buy it, and I hate giving these things away. I'm just so not a fan of any of the Unify routing equipment. It's just problematic, and it always falls short. I, I, I think it's a good consumer product for people that just need routing. The moment you need more advanced features, you are kind of left without a device that will do the more advanced features. So I don't really... Um, have a good use case for it outside of home users, but it's kind of an expensive home user toy. So I I don't think it's gonna have fewer issues than the UDM Pro because it's still the same software running it. It's a software problem. They're increasing some of the hardware around it, but the, the problems are still, hey, look at how terrible their VPN setup is, or hey, the way they handle a few, uh, you know, any advanced routing in there. Those problems didn't, I don't think there's going to be any change with the UDM Pro SE. It's just going to be like the same thing again with a fast... We're going to throw a faster processor at the same bad software. It doesn't solve any problems. Um, or faster uh, connections with the same software. It doesn't solve any problems. So, yeah. That's uh, best I can tell you with the UDM Pro stuff. Now, Unify 6, on the other hand, that is... Um, testing i've been doing i've been doing a longer term test on it because i want to see if there's any issues with it uh the problems so far have been pretty much none i installed one at my house connected all my devices to it so i will be doing an updated video but i wanted to do that testing and i think and i can let me look it up real quick uh how long has it been me logging into my house I know it has an update, and I purposely didn't load it because I just didn't want to ruin the uptime. Uh, we can do this. All right. There's Tom's house. Well, one of the devices is here, not at my house right now, but we'll switch to this screen here. Uh, I guess we got to move me. I got to look this way so I can move me here. There we go. Now I can look at here, and you guys can... See, we're all seeing the same thing. Um, I do have this Unify... Um, I have an in-wall. Then we have this one here. It's been running. My devices are connected to it at my house. Uh, I've been testing it for about a month and it's been working without a problem at all. I haven't had to reboot it or restart it. I could make some people at my house. Well, my son won't be too angry. and my wife will be upset. We're going to head and uh, we'll push a firmware update. And that should kick my wife off. Uh, well, the, she'll just jump over to the in-wall that's at the house as well. But I haven't had any issues with it, so I'm gonna do that review on there. We also have been doing some Wi-Fi 6 testing, comparing, of course, TP-Link to Unify. And Kyle's over there shaking his head going, yeah, we need a Faraday cage to get this test right, because there's a lot of uh, inconsistencies that we have run into trying to run that test. It is not, It has not been easy, so. It's not been a simple task at all. That's a simple, <laughs> we'll just say it that way. Um, UDM Pro, uh, actually the UDM Pro can do, if I'm not mistaken, multiple WAN addresses, but that's just one issue. Um, and I forget how they handle it or if it's better or not. I, I, I have to dig back into it. I mean, but multiple WAN addresses is like the least of our worries. It's obviously a big concern to call yourself a professional device and not be able to support multiple WAN, but all the other concerns with it, like especially VPN is where a lot of people run into tra challenges with it. So um let's see uh if you need a oh if you need a static it fails every time yeah uh multi-wan for failover only possibly they cannot do advanced layer three yeah i kind of need to do a video probably 
I've done videos where I do comparisons to firewalls, and I le I have I, if you look up like my 2021 firewall comparison, you will see I have a video where I break down the issues with the different firewalls, and Ubiquity is on there because so many people want to use it, but of course, it's on there falling short of all the things it can do. Uh, Khalid, thank you very much for the $5 donation. It's much appreciated. So awesome. Much appreciated. Um, so what's up with the Ubiquity these days? What's a good, uh, what's good, what's stable? Their switches and access points still work great. It's the bread and butter of their stuff. Well, so their point to point systems. I mean, we use a lot of those as well. The point to point system works. The uh, switches, they work great. We have lots of Ubiquity switches deployed. I have uh, one right here, you know, one of this 10 gig one. We've used this one and uh, this works great. We have behind me the Ubiquity 10 gig over here. That works great. My computer is running through this and so is the studio computer connected all to the 10 gig switch right here and everything works. It's wonderful. But there, once you start getting into the routing equipment, it just goes downhill from there. The two firewalls we still recommend is going to be PF Sensor Untangle. That's pretty much what we settled on that we like the best, that works, it's consistent, it's predictable, and those two uh, firewalls are solid. They will work perfectly fine with Ubiquity. And I say it like that because one of the challenges, the weird quirkiness that people have been running into with the DHCP problem, that was a firmware problem with Ubiquity. But it's a weird problem because it affects sonic walls terribly. If you have a sonic wall firewall and ubiquities with certain firmware and the access points, you will have a hard time getting IP addresses via DHCP. I think they finally solved it with some firmware, but sonic wall is not alone. There's a few other firewalls that have problems. Oddly, PF Sense and Untangle never seem to be of those firewalls. I don't know what they're doing different, but for whatever's going on, it seems to be when people in sonic wall being really popular, so it's easy to find a lot of these uh, cases and scenarios. They have a sonic wall firewall, ubiquity for an access point, and they certain models had DHCP problems. So that's um, uh, quirkiness. Let's see what else do we have. PF Sense works well enough. Yes, I, for a lot of people, PF Sense is just kind of a simple go to. It's it, it's great. Matter of fact, uh, in a chat the other day, I seen a few people just going on a the quantity of PF senses they all have in data centers. PF sense is actually really popular in uh, data center applications. So uh, PF sense and untangle was the other one I've talked about. There's plenty of untangle videos you can find in the uh, my channel. So if you look for untangle, you, you won't find me untangling wires, you'll find firewall reviews. <laughs> I heard that, Kyle. <laughs> is there any chance of PF Sense doing a Linux space like TrueNAS did? No. PF Sense is too deeply integrated to ever switch. It's based on the PF filter and BSD, so it's not switching. The people at NetGate do make another product, but it's not. It doesn't even have an interface. It's all command line driven, um, which is the TNSR system. So that system is Linux based. Uh, is there a way to set a default login count uh, for Pop OS? I don't know. I've never tried. I always choose the login that I'm going to log in with, and I rarely have any Pop OS. We have like one computer here in the office that has more than one login in it, but it's, most all of them are one to one. One person using a computer. You'd like to see a video of me untangling wires. Eh, you're not likely to see a video of me untangling wires. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I did have to untangle a lot of things to rebuild the studio, uh, to untangle all the wires from my old office to uh, put them all here. I actually do a decent cable management uh, on things. I don't, I've seen people say life's too short for cable management. I, uh, I don't buy into that. Uh, do you have Unify AC Pro with Juniper 3400 PoE? Uh, AP stops working after 30 days. Reconnect it, start working again. Huh. I don't have any Junipers out in the field, so I do not have an answer for that. Do I use YubiKey? I'll be doing some videos on YubiKey soon. Uh, yes, we even got Bitwarden set up to use YubiKey. Uh, YubiKeys are great. I, I think uh, for the different use cases, YubiKeys can work quite well. 
Um, doo -doo -doo -doo. How easy for management VLAN on unified devices to set up with PFSense? Uh, you can still do that if you want, if you want a management VLAN. What do I think of running PFSense in transparent mode? I don't really think about running PFSense in transparent mode. Um, not really. I, I, I don't have a use case for it. I Well, I can't say I don't. I have a video about a use case for it. Uh, it's an uncommon use case. So I don't, it, I guess if you have a use case, you can, it does. You can even run some Sericata in it. So if you type in PFSense transparent mode, I have a video on PFSense transparent mode. So uh, it's, it's, so it's not routing the traffic. So um, what else do we have here? That's weird. Concurrent viewers. So I'm actually going to share a screen with you. This is something strange. The concurrent viewers jumped and spiked, and now it's back down. There it goes. I don't know how many concurrent viewers is real. It, do I have 250 people here? I guess I do. It just says... I'm going to refresh the page. Sometimes that makes it when it goofs up. I don't know. That's a lot of people here. Thank you to everyone. By the way, there's only 29 likes, so smash the like button. <laughs> All right. Uh, next topic, though. Let's talk about something else. All right. Cool. 258. Awesome. So it does show how many. All right. Now I know how many enter. So uh, look at that. The like buttons are just jumping. I'm, I'm seeing all these likes right here. I can do this now, too. I can zoom in, make it bigger, make it easier to read. <laughs> All right. Cool. All the people. I actually have somewhere to be, so I got 15 more minutes before I have to leave here and go do a thing. But back to the TrueNAS. Oh, you know, there's something I, uh, I did the Rumble video, and uh, let me probably find it on Twitter. Um, this is clever. So when I did the video, this wasn't a feature and it's, just, this just became a feature. And I want to talk about this real quick. Cause this is clever. Wondering, uh, if you have CrowdStrike deployed on all the machines, Rumble now integrates with CrowdStrike Falcon. Uh, oh, that's actually not the one. Uh, was it this one here? Ah, this, this is cool. This asset has, uh, Kaspersky installed. This is a feature they added right after I did the video. It just cool coincidence. And um, this is kind of exciting. What they did here was add to the discovery. They're able, without logging into the machine, just by doing network discovery listening, uh, they're able now to determine if an asset has antivirus. And, and with some degree of accuracy with it, it's able to determine what antivirus is in there. And I'm like, oh, that's clever. Now they're getting better all the time. So this isn't, this is where it's at now, this feature, uh, their uh, improvements all are pretty fast. And so now they're able to do it even more. So they can do McAfee, Avast, AVG Free, uh, Checkpoint or Kaspersky, but that's what they can do now. They're going to be able to do more. And they did this after I did the video and I'm like, boy, that's an extra piece of information for the uh, uh, that when you're doing a discovery you didn't expect to do. So that's I thought that was pretty clever. Um, yeah, the Rumble thing. If you didn't watch it, it's a couple of it's I released it uh, about a week ago with a Rumble video, and it's uh, it's neat. It's a really cool discovery tool. It was just so fast you can enumerate a network and start seeing everything on it. And now you can also determine uh, a few of the antiviruses. And you're doing this without having any knowledge. You're going in blind on this network. You're just hitting it with Rumble and getting a lot of information. Really, yeah. Um, and one of our staff here, Eric, is uh, throwing in the comments there because he, he was using it for one uh, a client we're doing an onboarding with, and he was just able to find everything really quick. Like, oh, cool, there's all the stuff. It only took me a couple minutes, so. Kas Kaspersky, however you say it. Uh, would you say a VM host at a data center using PFSense or a VM on that host? I would run PFSense on hardware, if possible, at a data center. The problem is if you're VPNing to get to your data center and you're 
VPNing to get to your, it depends on how your lights out management is essentially is what I'm getting to. How do you manage those servers if something goes offline? Let's say you have it in your stack and your virtualization server and virtualization server has a problem. You have a problem if you have to reboot the virtualization server and you don't have them in some type of HA mode or if you have to bring both of them down and your firewall happens to be running in there. As long as you have some out of bandwidth way to do it, sure. If you don't have an out of band way to do it and you're VPNing in, you kind of need the firewall running on hardware. Of course, now what if the VPN or what if the hardware goes down? Well, in that case, do an HA. But now you're talking about if you do an HA PF sense, um, you have to have the rack space to do it. So there's a lot of considerations. I mean, do it if you want. I'm partial to running hardware whenever I can, but virtualization, it does work virtualized. Um, if you're using M365 Business Premium, do you need additional AV? Uh, we use Sentinel-1. That's our... We use Sentinel One and Huntress as our security products of choice. More on that coming soon because we're um, being upfront. We are a full reseller of both Huntress and Sentinel One. So we uh, contacted them directly. Looking over there, I got their cards pinned there. We met with the regional and local salespeople. So I will be doing some videos on the Sentinel One. So that's what we we really like the product. Um, we had a security incident today. Uh, well, client did. We stopped it, and Sentinel One stopped it. And it, it was localized, and uh, but we'll be doing some. I want to be diving in and doing some investigative work with uh, Sentinel One and doing some videos on how it works because I know there's a lot of people curious on how it builds its storylines and things like that. And we we I want to do some videos on it. Uh, but yes, so we that's that's the stack we're using right there. Um. Let's see, what else here? Does it still need, Mo what needs, oh, does Unify need MongoDB? Yes, Unify runs on MongoDB. I think if that if I'm connecting the two questions, you say, does it still need instead of the Unify? The Unify still runs on MongoDB. What's my go-to notes-taking app? Google Keep. Honestly, I still love Google Keep. That has been my notes-taking app forever. Uh, so, yeah, I, I don't have a reason to use something different. Uh, we, as a business, use G Suite, so G Suite has uh, worked really well with Google Keep and integration on it. Now, notes that I need secure are different because I actually just open up them on private servers I have and literally edit text documents for things like that. If it doesn't, if it's something I don't think should be, or potentially, like I would never put a password or anything too confidential in Google Keep, but general note taking, Google Keep is great for. Matter of fact, the notes I do for like my YouTube videos, I'll go in Google Keep. Um, when I'm starting to research something for a video, like I need this link and uh, I go and Google Keep and I create all the links and then I pin it to the top of my notes because it's actively something I'm working on. Uh, especially when I start doing testing, I may put all the test results in there. And then I have a tablet and I have a teleprompter set up and the teleprompter uses my tablet. My tablet's connected to my Google account with Google Keep on it. And that's how I have all the notes for anything I need. I don't I don't script my videos, but sometimes I want to make sure I'm accurately reading part numbers and notes. And that'll all be in the Google Keep document, which then goes into the tablet, which then shows up on the teleprompter. So that's the kind of... Uh, what are you going to do when Google discontinues Keep? <laughs> Uh, the Google, um, they got called out on one of their meetings about that, about, you know, killed by Google. I don't know if they're going to discontinue. If they discontinue keep, I'll use something else. I doubt it, but you know, it's, it's obviously something I'm aware of. Uh, I actually, one thing I will say for Google for all the stupid things they do with killing products, they at least allow you to export all your data from there. So it's not hard to get all my data out and move to whatever Google killed to something else that Google hasn't killed yet because they haven't bought it and killed it. So, hey, I am fully aware. I won't, I'm not going to defend Google and their... Uh, thing. Google did make an announcement though that they're going to start putting life cycle times on things. So when you use an application, you'll have at least some form of how long uh, before it does before it does this um, before they kill it. <laughs> it, it guarantees support times. Uh, let's see. Oh, um, two questions here. 
Uh, let's see. Does firewall HTTPS proxy still make sense for endpoint security? Uh, a firewall and proxy and security. I'm not form that in a better question. I'll try to answer it. Um, is there a way on TrueNAS to replicate to another TrueNAS server without keeping the encryption or the new system encryption? Trying to upgrade encryption is Windows copy the only way. Uh, I believe you could easily use something like rsync. If you're talking about how to get all the data from where it is to where you want it to be, ZFS, if you do ZFS replication, I believe will always copy the encryption. There might be a way you can not do it. I remember I had a problem and I don't know if that was addressed. If you tried to have the destination not have the encryption, I think it kept copying the encryption bit over. Easy workaround though, is just use rsync. You set up rsync on two different TrueNAS servers. rsync won't transport any of the encryption. So that will create on your destination system an unencrypted uh, copy of all your data you send over. So, I mean, Windows copy will work, but that's going to be slow when you're, you know, getting in between there. rsync is fast and uh, having it talk rsync is a good way. It is an easy way to do that if you're trying to do that. So, um... SD-WAN, kind of on an as-needed basis. It's not something we do all the time. I think SD-WAN is overhyped and oversold. Uh, and matter of fact, sometimes even misimplemented uh, by things. One of the, I, I want to do a video, and I've been making some notes on this. Uh, there was a good video by, I think it was ASAP Science. And it talked about subtractive solutions as opposed to additive solutions. It's a mental exercise thing. And a lot of people always go towards add another layer, add another layer as the solution. We're going to solve the problem by adding more layers to this. And uh, I think that's something that happens a lot where people keep trying. I always start to asking, what's the goal of the project when we take on a project? Because uh, they start with sometimes, I want to put this complicated thing in. I need an SD-WAN. Why do you need an SD-WAN? What is the goal? What are you trying to accomplish? And can it be done simpler? Now, maybe the end result is still putting an SD-WAN solution in, but I actually want to put a video together on talking about one threat surface because it directly relates to this is people are like, hey, add all these solutions. I'm like, all right, you now have more companies involved in securing a client, but every one of these companies now is that threat surface increases. Now, whether or not they're a good steward of their product and whether or not there could be compromises, you know, levels of trust that always have to be uh, in place. But when you think about it from that standpoint, you go, huh, I have two companies that have access now. If I add this third solution, that third solution also means one more company now has been added to the mix along with all the other software the client has to run for their line of business. And now we can create a more complex problem. Is there an easier way to do this? And I like to just always ask that first. So... Oh, uh, let's see. <clears throat> oh, want to know if breaking HTTPS at the firewall inspection or is it better to uh, secure the endpoints? Uh, breaking HTTPS at the firewall is always, always a headache. Um, endpoint, really focusing on endpoints. And by the way, so many things just blow right through those HTTPS SL inspectors. Uh, endpoint protection is still the most, to me, still one of the most important things you need on a system is the endpoint protection. Uh, it, you can only do so much, but it ha that whatever that thing they're trying to get across, it has to do something more when it gets to the endpoint. So if you're using something at the endpoint to watch it and watch for execution and stop anything from actually running, that's where the lockdown really has to occur. So... Um, let's see. Four sites, SD-WAN, four months later, not working. P2P VPN, one day later, working. Yeah, that sometimes it, uh, just setting up a VPN is just a better solution for that problem. So, yeah, that's <laughs> as simple as that. Um... I already talked about the UDM Pro SE, so scroll back in the uh, video for that. <clears throat> uh, ticket solution, we're still using Freshdesk. It works. And someone will point out it's basic, blah, blah, blah. And uh, there's a good forum post I have on, uh, someone had commented, and I agree completely with this. 
you can implement some of these more complicated systems that maybe make management happy, but ultimately it's a balance of finding the usability of the people who actually use it and the reporting and the functionality of it. So are there systems that may have more functionality? Yeah, but if we found them more complicated and clunky to use, then we ended up not liking them as much. Um, we needed that happy middle of just closing tickets and action items that are based on them. So uh, we've actually found fresh desk to be pretty simple, straightforward, and really easy to use. Um, yeah, someone else said fresh test is nice. VPN, your VPN provider gives you WireGuard connections and OpenVPN. If you're familiar with WireGuard and they have a right, they have an easy enough write up to set it up. I mean, WireGuard is a win win for the, you know, privacy based VPN. I don't even know if I want to call them private. I guess we'll call them privacy VPNs. I'm not really a big fan of a lot of those. Um, they're oversold and overhyped to why, but. If you have a reason, a use case to use one of those VPN services, uh, WireGuard is going to be a faster transport method to get your data back and forth over OpenVPN. Uh, can you talk about the setup behind you? I have a rack build video and uh, I can link to it. I think I even called it Home Lab Rack. Home Lab Rack. Find that real quick. That's from two years, eight months ago. DIY home rack build. So this covers all the details of everything I have in there. Uh, so I'll share this out. But if you do any of the rack build videos, there's a couple of them. And they're, uh, matter of fact, even if you watch the older one, it's not that the older one isn't relevant. The older one just shows an older variation of this. So yeah. There you go. So search my channel. You'll find I've done a few of these different build videos and build it in different ways. So whichever whichever one works for you. All right. What else do we have? We got a few more minutes. Uh, can you talk about your setup? You got that one. Well, PF Sense Kit, MPLS, VPLS support. I have no idea, Corey. <laughs> Not sure when that'll happen. Um... What's going on with the TP-Link on-premise cloud controller? Uh, can you cover all the different combinations of what you run and what? I did a video on the TP-Link. I haven't done an updated video, so they have a cloud controller. It works. I uh, I found some shortcomings of the way they implemented things. I pointed that out in the video. I have not had time to really go back. We don't deploy it commercially, so and I don't plan to. We still do Unify. Where to get used hardware? eBay. Um... I mean, if you can, if you have a local place, awesome. If you have a local recycler, but if you're not lucky enough to have a local recycler that will let you buy stuff from them directly, eBay, eBay is a great place. If you're looking for a more professional used hardware with warranty, Tech Supply Direct, we have an offer code down below to get you 10% off. So uh, that's uh, not a place to. Will we see more of your bike riding videos? Um, I need to make more. I have all kinds of video I do on bike, and then I don't do anything with it. I, I kind of debate of how much I should record. I have all kinds of recordings. I have GoPros, and then I'm like, oh, that's cool. And then I just kind of, yeah, so. <laughs> uh... I don't no this i should do a video titled this because that way i can just say it's such a bad idea because this is something people fill the contact form up for and ask in in the live stream how do i make pf sense work with my unified dream machine i don't know why you would do that they're both firewalls they are competing products so there's not really any good reason to use both products you can double nat things you can functionally make it work it's just tedious and stupid to do it that well uh, stupid is probably too harsh. We'll just say I don't have a good use case for that. Um, so I don't know why you would want to take and put a unified dream machine along with a PF Sense. They are both routers. Why do you want two routers? So now, technically, I, I called it stupid. Technically, there's a unified dream machine here that's plugged in and it's behind our main PF Sense that we have for the building. But we did it for a lab. So I guess in a lab environment, that's a good reason to do it. Um, 
I don't use a Vi on VLANs, but you can if it makes you happy. We keep things a little bit more locked down than that. Reason to use them is Unify Protect. I recommend if you're going to, when you look at the pricing, if you want Unify Protect, don't get a Dream Machine. Go ahead and buy the Unify NVR, like this one right here. I think they're about the same price um, without looking. If I, the Dream Machine Pro and the, uh, well, what? I know the internet works over here and we can look. Um, go over to the store. Three seventy nine for the Unified Dream Machine. Um, oh, there's this one. Four ninety nine for this one. The Network Video Recorder Pro. And two ninety nine for this. It's cheaper to buy this for a network video recorder uh, than it is to buy the Unified Dream Machine. So I think that kind of answers it. Like if you need the recording, you may as well do it with the uh, NVR. So. Yeah, this is another one uh, that comes up a lot. It's so many people asking me, there's allegedly, there's some hacky way to do this. And what it is is uh, Dream Machine and multiple uh, VLANs on the WAN side because some internet providers deliver internet and TV and split it that way. Yeah. So it's, it's like, yeah, that's one of the challenges that you run into. Now, there's ways to do it by putting a switch in front of it and splitting out the VLANs before they get to it. But uh, if you use PFSense, you're able to do it with one device and that's what a lot of people are probably wanting to do is set it up with one device so one more shortcoming on the unify side uh do you think they'll ever put access or anything on the udm pro no idea they if, if unify has a roadmap secretly hidden somewhere um then i'm sure there's it's on a whiteboard somewhere uh it would be great if it was a little bit more public facing but i don't know uh, did you eventually migrate to free PBX? We've been in free PBX for five or six years. So, um, yes, we've been in free PBX, free PBX for a while now. I don't remember exactly when we switched, but it's not a recent switch. <laughs> 307 viewers. Nice. There's a lot of people here. A um, few more questions. What else can I answer? How haven't I pulled all my hair out yet? <laughs> I don't know if that's directed at me or not. Unify Leaf Switch. I haven't tested it. I mean, if you have a need for those connections, awesome. It seems an odd target market Unify is going for to put themselves at data center level stuff. It, If I'm not mistaken, Leaf Switch doesn't even have um like redundant power supplies or anything in it so it seems like it's got some shortcomings oh let's see see oh it's question what pfsense firewalls do you recommend to isolate point of sale credit card terminals from other lands you just put them on a separate network they don't need to, so your point of sale systems don't need to, depending on some few details here, but your point of sale credit card systems, if we put them on their own separate network, which is probably not a bad idea, they don't need anything but internet. They probably don't even need to talk to the other lands. So lock them down. Let not Don't let the other lands talk to them. They don't need to talk to the other lands. You keep them in a very narrow lane um, and allowing them to connect to the services they need to connect to. So... Simple as that. Um, you don't have to get too complicated. Smash the like button. 300 people and uh, 320 people and 117 likes. So that helps the YouTube algorithm know that you uh, like me answering questions. So <laughs> um, have I used the FS.com switches? Uh, they, they look okay. Um, I have not used them. I don't have a strong interest in them. They don't have a... That I can... Uh, that I don't think they have. Uh, Serve the Home did a review of them. I didn't notice any central management for them, so that kind of 
the, kind of rules them out in some scenarios, but they, they seem to be a decent switch, like for individual switches. So if you don't really need all the monitoring that you get with something, some of the other switching uh, stuff from other companies, maybe they're a good solution, a, a reliable solution. So, but I don't have a strong, you know, run out and get them type of use case. Uh, what 10 gig card do you recommend that's not a wallet breaker? Um, really, any of these SFP cards? Uh, I don't even know what kind this one. I think this is a Chelsea IO one. Uh, the Chelsea IO and Intel ones generally work quite well. They're and these are under a hundred dollars, they have two 10 gig ports on them. So, and uh, if you're running TrueNAS U5. The Asus RJ45 uh, Asus 10 gig card is now supported as of TrueNAS 12.0 U5. I covered that in my video earlier today. Yeah, Intel X520 DA2. That's another one. Um, there are plenty of them you can find, those Intel uh, DA520s. Um, oh, what's in the drawer behind me? Uh, junk. Um, you know, there is, hold on. <laughs> I know I can find at least one old. There's not too much old stuff in there. It's just a little connectors. But I have this in here. I don't... It's an IDE to CF card. Uh, this actually was part of an old voicemail uh, phone system. <laughs> it, it, I, I think it's probably still what's loaded on here. Uh, you used to pop it in the motherboard, and it's got the little... If you recognize that, that's the floppy power connector. Um, so, yeah, there are occasional um, old things you'll find. I don't, I'm not a hoarder of old technology. I throw most of it away. Recycle it. I can't really say throw it away. It would it'd be inaccurate. I actually do. Uh, we have a recycler that comes here. I get rid of stuff all the time. I'm not, I'm not a hoarder of old things. All right. Uh, I have. My wife said she's picking me up in two minutes. So. Two more minutes. Rapid fire questions here. What can I answer? Anything that occurs to you? One X slot uh, works for PF Sense. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> yeah, this is really old. Intel X520 works with Synology. Um, I think so. I don't know that for certain. I see people. Maybe someone's may, maybe seen it. Retro computing. Oh, I like retro computing, but I like emulators. Like the I, I'm a big fan of the Raspberry Pi with an emulator. The it's on tip my tongue. Jay's done a bunch of videos. Jay from Learn Linux TV has done several videos on it. Uh, the the Pi Emulator Project. Why is it on tip of my tongue? <laughs> I, the Retro Retro Pi. That's it. Uh, retro Pi. I do have Retro Pi. Jay from Learn Linux TV has done some good videos on it. So yeah, Retro Pi is great. I do like my old games. Um, let me message my wife back. Do we talk about the new studio? Yeah, I talked about the new studio earlier. Let me message my wife and let her know I'm wrapping up the live stream now and then I'm going to scoot her home. All right. Um... Should I look at running PFSense in a VM to secure VMs for testing or just firewall and IP tables for sandbox testing? I, I guess I need more context for that. Uh, nested virtualization, does it work? Yes, you can use nested virtualization. It works. Um, it works in XCPNG. And I think if you type in nested virtualization on my channel, you'll find a video I did on that. Uh, barrier for multiple keyboards. I have not used it, but I'm aware of it. Um, I thought about it because I do have the keyboard here and I could swing it around to control the other computer that's over here. Um, anything else? A friend has been uh, trying to convince me to do nested virtualization. Yeah, there's uh, there's some good write-ups. Uh, craft Computing, Jeff, 
he did a good video on you know how to set up gaming computers so you can share a video card and have multiple people logged in so uh there's a couple write-ups level one text if you type in nested virtualization or um video card pass through there's some good write-ups that wendell at level one text has done uh, there's some good community projects for that so it's it's definitely pretty cool um there's some use cases that are for it i don't really do it much so yeah uh how's true nas scale have i tried the containers uh true nas scale is buggy so that's wrong it's beta so i guess it was it, it's not finished so that's where true nas scale is i tried it i thought it was okay the containers some worked some didn't i remember which ones did or didn't i i was like yeah i'll wait till i'll wait till it's released before i even bother diving into it because i don't run i don't have a lot of things i need to run in containers even on TrueNAS. TrueNAS runs TrueNAS for file storage for me. The only can the only jail it runs is a sync thing jail. So I don't do too much inside of TrueNAS. Uh, yeah, that's why I haven't done videos. I don't use Nextcloud either. Uh, but it's supposed to be a lot better because it's going to use Docker containers. And Docker containers are more popular and have more developers behind them than the jail system in there. So I'm sure it's going to work well. Uh, other vert programs. I there's a lot of them out there. I don't have time to check them all out. I mean, there's all kinds of novel stuff, but I don't have a use case for it. Um, what do you use as an X called alternative? I don't have. I use G Suite for my business. Um, all my document sharing is done in G Suite, so that's why we don't have an xCloud server. So it's not really a next. I mean, nextcloud, if you are looking for something to privately run and host, thumbs up. Nextcloud is a good product. Uh, for our business, nextcloud is not as good of a product. It's too hard to maintain, and interoperability is a lot more work. So uh, G Suite's great for business. Like it or love it or hate it, uh, it's a good bit. We have a strong business use case for it over Office 365. I'm not a big Office 365 fan. We support it. We Our clients use it. So uh, I may not be a fan of it, but trust me, we are really well aware of it as a product. <laughs> um, I'm not a Cisco field engineer, so I can't really answer you about Cisco field engineer sites. Can you get a good deal on a Go Anywhere server? I have no idea. All right, I think that's all for the rapid fire questions. Thank you for everyone who joined. Awesome seeing that many people here. Uh, we we peaked, what did we peak at here? Like uh, 318 people, that's awesome. Thank you for everyone who joined. Gotta look at the right camera. I'm forgetting already that when I switch cameras, I can I, I gotta look at this one now. <laughs> uh, no, you can't really get G Suite better than prices from Google. Um, you. Uh, you can look at the resellers, like if you buy it in bulk, there's, but for the most part, no, you you just pay what G Suite pays on those. That's not where you really make money on it. So, so, all right. Awesome. Thank you everyone. And thanks for joining. Just following through all the questions, head over to the forums. If you want to engage back and forth and have some banter with me, uh, I occasionally do wander into discord. I do have a discord channel. I'll bring it up and I'm not there very often. Uh, I go in and try to check it once a day, maybe, but the forums I check twice a day and uh, try to reply to all the questions. So forums.lawrencesystems.com. If you just got questions, if you want to hire share project, uh, that's actually via our website, but absolutely thank you everyone who smashed the like button and thank you everyone for joining